is Danielle Warnick. This is Monday, November 10th, 2014, and I am at Merritt's CX in South Jordan, Utah, interviewing Corinne Clark for the purposes of the Utah Women's Walk. Today we are going to be talking about Corinne's life and her contributions to life in the state of Utah. So tell us briefly about your background. When and where were you born? Where did you attend school? Things like that. I didn't grow up in this country. I spent most of my time in Germany. My father was in the military. And the first time I came to Utah was in 1981 to go to college. I went to school at Brigham Young University. I got both my undergraduate degree and my graduate degree there. So happy to be a, an MBA student from BYU. Uh, do you have siblings? So I grew up in a family with their four kids parents were still married. I'm the oldest. I have a sister who's brilliant and two younger brothers who are also brilliant. And it's always been the four of us. So we've always been really close and I speak to them every week. Are you close to your parents? I'm very close to my parents. They were, um, they are humble, humble people who grew up very poor, but they educated themselves and they educated their children and they taught us how to work, they taught us how to help other people, they taught us how to contribute. They live in southern Utah and they have a great life and I'll spend the rest of my life making sure that they have a fabulous life. Talk to us a little bit about your childhood, what it was like growing up in Germany and in a military family. And uh, tell us if there are aspects of being raised overseas that you think have helped you in your career. I grew up in a military family. We traveled all the time, and it was really just about the four kids and my two parents. Um, I think I struggled a bit as a young person. I was paralyzingly shy, afraid of everything and everyone. It, but yet my parents taught us never to be uh, afraid of what we could do and to never give up, so it's kind of an interesting dynamic. Um, I, my father went to Vietnam, two tours, and so I'm one of those kids. I'm that kid that had to say goodbye to their dad twice and was never sure if he was coming back. Um, I got bullied as a kid. People are usually surprised to find out that, um, yes, there was even bullying back then. But it was wonderful growing up overseas. We got to travel. We didn't have a television, so we spent a lot of time playing with each other and games and reading and I had a library card. We went to the library every Saturday together. So it was a pretty good life, um, except for the bullying part. But I didn't know any different. So I, I guess it was, uh, I can see that I'm a product of my childhood, that we worked hard, we played hard, and to this day really close with my family. As, um, actually, let's wait for that. Uh, did you have one particular person that influenced or mentored you that you feel had a particular influence? And who are the women that you admired growing up? Well, I always admired my mother because she came from a very humble beginning. She was a beauty queen. She wanted me to be a hairdresser. So I'm a little bit of a disappointment in that <laughs> regard. But she, she believed in us and she taught us to never give up, to believe in ourselves. Um, when I was growing up, there was a, a leader in my church who um, was very attached to me. And I think she must have seen the potential that I didn't see in myself. And she worked with me on a number of projects that were youth assignments. And she pushed me. So I, would, I built a flyer and a program, and she made me redo it until it was perfect. And it was so frustrating for me. But to this day, I'm probably the best proofreader that we have around, because she taught me that it needs to be right if we're going to do it. As a girl, did you plan on being a wife and a mother? Did you plan on being a career woman? Did you imagine this life for yourself when you were? When I was growing up, I was a tomboy, played on all kinds of sports teams, loved being part of the team, even though I was super shy. And I always wanted to be a math teacher, and I wanted to have six kids. 
And I didn't know how to get there. I just knew that I needed to go to college. So I never planned on having a career. I never thought of myself as being a career woman. All my roommates in college would say otherwise. They would say, oh, yeah, she was going to be the one who was going to have a job. I didn't, I didn't know that, though. Um, I couldn't have children for a very long time. So when, you, when you're part of that infertility crowd, you end up working. And so I found out that I had skills. I was good at a few things, and I just kept working. And here I am today, still working. Why did you make the decision to attend BYU? So when I was in Germany, I didn't really have anyone helping me figure out what college I should go to. So I applied to some really random schools like Columbia, the Colorado Institute of Art, and Brigham Young University. None of them matched. And my father came into my room one day and said, your mother and I will pay for any college that you'd like to go to, but we would feel better if you went to Brigham Young University. And I think it's because they probably saw the co-ed dorm flyer for Columbia. So I have a lot of respect for my father. So I said, okay. Had never been to Utah in my life. Came to Utah, flew, flew to Utah, got off the plane, got, went out to the airport. There was no streetcars, no underground, no people, no trees. So I got back on the plane and flew back <laughs> because I said, not for me. I came back eventually. So, and I'm glad I did because it was a great experience. Will you tell us a little bit about um, about your your college years and getting your degrees at, B, at BYU, meeting your husband? So when I started at BYU, I thought I was going to be a design major because I love to draw, I love to paint. There's a very, I have a very creative side. But I didn't love the program because it was very competitive and I didn't want something that I loved to turn into something that I didn't love. So I t got a job at the BYU library, and I thought I'd be a librarian because I wanted to teach children how to read. I met my college sweetheart there, and we've been married 31 years. And he was supportive of whatever I wanted to do. The entire time I was at the library, I was looking for ways to automate it and do things better, partly a function of me having to resort the card catalog every time somebody would throw the cards out. So I really wanted to get rid of the card catalog. But I love technology. I had a passion for technology, so I ended up with a job in technology and uh, left the library, went to work at Novell, and I got my MBA while I was at Novell. Um, tell us, so how, how instrumental has your work at Novell been to the overall success of your career? I spent almost 15 years at Novell, and as a young person in a company that was so successful and growing so rapidly, I was able to have some pretty big jobs. And if you look at some of the people that we worked, that I worked with, they're all in wonderful companies doing great jobs. So it was a great pedigree to be able to spend time at Novell. And I learned so much there. I still have connections from people that I worked with there. It really was a wonderful experience for me. Uh, so it's so you moved from Novell and then you to Altiris, is that correct? So I was actually let go from Novell. It was probably one of the most traumatic things in my young life because I would have stayed there forever. I would have been the person to turn off the lights. And when someone tells you you're not needed here anymore when you've been there for 14 years, I thought this is this has got to be the worst thing ever. And it ended up being a springboard for me to go on to do some unbelievable things. So I went to this little startup called Altiris, and people said, why would you go from this big job, big money, big people, big title, big office, to work in a cubicle at the bottom of the pile for a little tiny startup? The president of Altiris was Greg Butterfield, and he said, you're curious to me. I don't understand why you're here. I was willing to lose to win because I knew that I could add value to that little company and that I could benefit from that. So you've been quite the powerhouse from Altiris to Symantec to here at Merit CX. Um, talk to me a little bit about how you developed, how you went from the shy kid to being able to develop that kind of confidence to become such a leader. I feel like I'm one of the most blessed humans on the planet because I really don't believe I deserve any credit for what I've been able to achieve because 
I benefited from wonderful teams and wonderful experiences and wonderful opportunities every step of the way. If you look at my career, I went from a library to Novell, and then I lost my job, and then I went to Alturas and was able to take everything that I had learned at Novell with great people and build this little software company that attracted the attention of Symantec. And then I had an opportunity, and I wasn't in support of the acquisition, I was the only one who wasn't, but I was the only one who stayed. I ended up in a terrific job at a great company. And then I did that, and then I, I ended up at Allegiance because I um, had this per personal situation where I got cancer and decided I wanted something different. And I think the, the, the pattern through the whole time is that I wasn't afraid to move toward anxiety even though I was this really shy kid growing up. And I think that I learned that it's okay to have this quiet strength, but it's not okay to let other people decide what happens to you. So I always felt like I had a chance to do things that I really wanted to do. So what would you deem to be your greatest hits, so to speak, from from all the projects you've been a part of, and are there any low points from your career that you'd be willing to share with us? Well, my greatest hits really are my two children. So I have a 20-year-old and a 12-year-old, boys who are amazing humans. And everything I do, I do for the three men in my life, so my husband and my two sons. I call them my three sons because I am still raising my husband. And it drives me to do great things because I'm not afraid. And I really want to show my children what it means to make decisions, to be a person of integrity, and to not let fear determine what happens to you. There's plenty of low lights. Losing my job was devastating for me. And when I came home that night, my son said, are we going to have enough to eat? And I had lived my life where I carried no debt and was very careful and still my son's worried about not eating. That's a terrible feeling. Um, when I had cancer, I was at the top of my career at Symantec and I had to walk away from a job that I loved and a team that I adored to fight this awful, awful disease. But my goal is to leave a legacy of talent that works beautifully without me. And because that had been my goal, when I had to walk away to take care of the cancer, they worked beautifully without me. So I'm super proud of that. So have you experienced discrimination as a woman in a male-dominated field? And can you tell us a little bit about those experiences? I think it's tough to be a woman in corporate America. It shouldn't be, but I think it is. When I graduated from college, my father said to me, I'm sorry the world's not better for you. I thought it would be, but it's not. And I'm always very surprised when I run into it. So as a senior executive in technology, very rarely are there other women in the room. And I don't notice it until I go to the bathroom at the break and there's nobody to talk to. And then it occurs to me, oh yeah, there's no girls here. Uh, it's a shame because women uh, are bright and capable and can do unbelievable things. But I think that it's lonely and isolating sometimes. So I, I do experience discrimination and uh, challenging colleagues that aren't as highly evolved as they probably should be but I never let it get to me and I never I try not to be bugged I try to turn it into a joke I try to make people laugh because I don't think that um, my colleagues do it intentionally I just think they lack awareness about how they're perceived sometimes so uh, following up on that would you consider yourself a feminist would that be a label that you would subscribe to so I gave a presentation last year, I think. I titled it The Accidental Feminist. Because feminism, has, I think, has gotten a bad rap. And when I did a little research, I realized that a feminist is anyone who believes in equal rights for women. So I guess I'm trying to raise a bunch of feminists at home, and I'm trying to uh, make sure that we're all feminists because it's not that crazy divorced woman down the street. It really is that we are striving for equal rights and equal opportunities for women and that we're 
careful about the decisions that we make so that we're not causing any unintended consequences that would limit women, men, young people, anyone really. So talk to me a little bit about um, about some of the accolades that you've received throughout your career um, and which one has meant the most to you. If you had to pick just one, what would that be? I'm not really a collector of awards. I prefer to be in the background. I, I'm happy to introduce a recipient of award, but I'm pretty uncomfortable typically. Um, there was one award that I got that I was very surprised at that is probably my favorite award. And I was attending um, my son's year-end school award ceremony. And at the end of the ceremony, and he had won a bunch of awards, but at the end of the ceremony, they gave a war, an award to the coolest parent, and I got that award. And it's because my band played at their school when they needed a band, but my son was the happiest that he had ever been, and he said, Mom, my capital went way up in the school. And I, I didn't know that was an award, and I didn't know I was up for that award, so I was pretty happy that I won that award. So talk to us a little bit about your band, and are there, are there other things that you enjoy doing in your spare time? So I play in a rock and roll band. I am the least talented member of the band, but I'm okay with that because the boys are super talented. The band's name is Manage This. We've been together for 10 years. We've played at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. We were the finalists in the Battle of the Corporate Bands. We play for charity. We play for high schools. We play for mostly for young people because most young people don't have access to live music anymore, so they have iPods or DJs, and we love to play for anyone who will dance. It's all cover tunes. It's not something I ever would have thought I would do. It's not a chapter of my life I ever would have written, and it's the most fun that I have, I have ever had. I have a lot of other interests. I'm genuinely curious about the world, so I read, I study, I write, I paint, um, I exercise, I love being outside, I bike with my kids, I walk half marathons and marathons, I'm, I try to be as active as I can because I don't know how much life I've got left and I'm trying to jam it all in. So if you were to go back in time and choose a different path, where do you think you would be right now? I wanted to have six children and be super mom and drive carpool and go to PTA and work out during the daytime. I never had that option, so I think that I would I think that I could do that. I think I could organize a pretty awesome neighborhood mother activity thing. Um, but I never got to do that. They told me I'd never have children, so um, you know I had these two boys that I finally had after no doesn't mean no. But um, I think that's something that I really wish that I had had for my life. But I didn't have it, so I don't think about it a lot. I know that a lot of moms have to make tough decisions, and a lot of women work. So if I'm going to work, I'm going to be the best executive that I can be, and then when I'm home, I'm the best mom that I can be. So if you are comfortable sharing, um, what would you consider to be the greatest trial of your life? And how has that, um, how has overcoming that challenge or dealing with that challenge um, shaped who you are now? So I feel very blessed to have the life that I've had. And people that know me say, really, you've had all these struggles. I guess I never thought of it that way. So when I was shy, I never really thought of it as a struggle. It was just who I was. When I um, couldn't have any children, it's tough to, be, to want children and not have it. And that was a struggle for me. But I, I ended up getting two kids here. It took me 22 years to get them. So they're, they're awesome if I didn't mention that. Um, I think my greatest struggle probably was when I was diagnosed with cancer in January of 2012. A lot of people have cancer, so it's not that that's unique. It's that I was 48 years old and they gave me a 20% chance to beat it. And to look in the eyes of my son who was nine and to tell him that I'm not sure I can beat this. And he said, mom, don't die. Please don't leave me with dad. 
And so it gave me this fuel to fight and to win. So, so far, I've been able to uh, stay on top of it. Um, but it changed me because if, when you think you're going to die, it changes you forever. And you don't worry about things that you used to worry about. You don't sleep late. You don't watch television. You don't waste time doing things that you don't want to do. And you really look at things a lot differently. So that challenge, that really tough time, actually gave me a gift that I would never trade. And so I feel like I'm much more comfortable in my skin and much more settled in what I need to do. And I think even more fearless than I was before. So do you have a mantra or a motto or piece of advice that, that keeps you going? Well, I have a couple things that I remind myself all the time. So I'm still that shy teenager who ate lunch by herself every day. And I have to remind myself to not let fear determine my fate and to move toward anxiety because there really are wonderful things that um, we can do if we don't stop ourselves. Um, I have a sign over my front door that says this family does hard things. And so I've realized that I'm a lot stronger than I ever knew. And I think most women are. They might not find out till too late though. And so if young people can figure out early that they shouldn't let anything stop them, that they do matter, and that we can do hard things, then you know, I will have done what I came here to do. So uh, how, how big of a part has your spirituality played in various aspects of your life? And do you let that guide your business, any of your business decisions, or do you keep your spirituality <coughs> separate from your work life? I'm a person of tremendous faith. I think I always have been. Uh, maybe because when my father went to war, I was praying every day that he would come back. Thankfully, he came back. And I've seen times in my life where I've been comforted to, by that faith and by, by having a awareness, a spiritual awareness. Um, that has probably formed me more than anything else because when you face something very difficult, like the, you might die, you have to decide, are you going to rely on that faith that you've had or are you going to be afraid? And my faith has gotten me through every single opportunity and challenge. Um, my company was just acquired by a new company and there were a number of missteps and problems and issues that came along the, every step of the way. But I knew, I had this quiet assurance that everything would be just fine and that everything would be the way it was supposed to. So when other people doubted and when there were huge, huge problems and issues, I could calmly sit there and say, I know what I have to do. I promise you, I'm not this good. It's that I had help and I felt that help I don't know if it's people that have gone on before me. I don't know if it's, um, it's part of my spirit, but I know with complete assurance that I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And I think that's helped me be solid in who I am and what I need to do. So what do you have planned for your future? What would you like to accomplish? Well, we have so much to do in the future. We have so much because I've got to get it all in before I leave this planet. Um, I am excited about my new company and what we're going to be able to do for the employees of this new company. The new company is called Merit CX and there are about 900 people who are waiting to see what we're going to do so they're going to be helping me. Um, I can't wait to see how my sons turn out. So my older son will be home next, um, next spring and he's going to be going to college and he's got his whole life ahead of him. And my younger son is only 12, has got his whole life ahead of him, so I plan on playing a big part in their lives to make sure that they turn out all right. Um, I don't set stars on the horizon like I want to be this CEO or I want to be that. I just want to keep having fun. I want to continue to build for this planet, and I want to leave a legacy of talent. That works beautifully without me because I'll be gone someday. And I hope they say nice things about me. I hope they say she was fun.
So is is that what you would like to be remembered for? For being fun, for leaving a legacy of talent? Are those are those the the most significant things that you would like to be remembered for? I'd like to be remembered for being hilarious. I would like to be remembered for always lifting everywhere I went. And I would like to leave a legacy of talent that works beautifully without me. And I plan to do that for my sons. Uh, I want them to not be sad when I go. I want them to have great memories that they, that they could say they had a lot of fun and that they might have learned something from their mom. So what would be the most important advice you think you could give to, to the next generation of Utahns, to ambition, ambitious young women, and to your own kids? Too many people don't follow their instinct. Too many people let fear stop them from realizing their dreams. It's not because other people stop them. It's because they're afraid of something. And too many people let fear determine their fate. So if I could get young people, young men, young women, to understand that there's nothing that they couldn't do, nothing. And that no doesn't mean no. And that if you're determined and you work hard, that you can reach every single dream that you have. So I, this, that, that is all that I have for you. But Michelle, is there anything additional <coughs> that you would like yeah, to let add? Me, yeah, you've done a great job. Thank mm -hmm. you, Danny. She a, did a great she job. She did a great Come on, job. Come on, fix her jacket. Tell us um, what a typical it. day is like for you. Are you up at the crack of dawn? Oh, and yes. Give us a typical day scenario. Well, I am an early riser. So I'm usually up at 4 or 4.30. If I sleep in, it's 4.30. And even on the weekend. So I'm up early. I usually go to the gym, lift weights, and then do 20 minutes of cardio. Come back, get the men in my house moving, which is a big job because they're all night owls. Uh, get lunches, breakfast, everybody out the door, get myself ready out the door. I'm usually on the phone or email from the time I get up until I go to sleep. Get to work, spend most of my day in meetings, on phone calls, trying to get as much done as possible. Um, I don't get home very early, so I'm usually around 7. Have dinner together with the family, do homework. Um, I usually read until about 10.30. And then I get back up and do it again. I spend my weekends getting organized for the week, so I'm highly organized. And if I can fit things in that are good mom things, then I do that during the week. But Amazon makes me a good mother because I buy everything online. I don't think we captured your amazing career so well because you're not going to brag about yourself. But you took Alteris from. <coughs> Company of 62 million to 230 million in a four year period. Tell us about how you did that. What's your leadership style? I mean, how, how have you done some of these things? So, Altiris was a wonderful company and they were poised for greatness. And I, got, I came at the right time. I took an individual contributor job for a lot less money, a lot less everything, less title, less. And people were curious about why I would do that. I saw the potential in the company, but I also knew that my skills would play nicely in helping grow that company. So I think it was the only employee that was an individual contributor who moved all the way to executive staff. I think I was the only employee that um, got to build a team from scratch. So there were wonderful, wonderful people there, and we were a, an awesome team. And Greg Butterfield, who's one of my mentors, he let me run, and he let me run fast, and he trusted me. And I got to participate in building a partner program, which helped that company grow revenue a lot faster than they probably would have. I can see my fingerprints on lots of parts of that company, but that company wouldn't have been anything without Greg Butterfield and the executives and the employees of that company. It really, it really was a very special, special company. What are some of your qualities that you have that have helped you? Like, I, I know you're good at recognizing people who have talent and pulling them in. What are some of the other, other qualities you have that I, help to do what you do? I think I learned a lot from my father, who was a brigade commander in the Army. And 
he taught me what it meant to be a leader. He taught me how to recognize talent in people. And he taught me to hire for fit and teach the other skills. And so I've been able to be with some wonderful teams. I love my, everywhere I go, I love my team because I get to work with people who are better at their job than I ever would be. I think I'm pretty transparent with my teams, meaning I just, I don't filter myself. I just, if I don't know something, I say, I don't know. If I think something's wrong, I tell them I'm not convinced. This still feels like a mistake, but I'm willing to spend the time to understand what's the right solution, but also trust them to do their job. Have you had any female mentors at all in business? They all been male, and who else has impacted your life? I've had both male and female mentors in my life. One of my female mentors was named Barbara Lyon. She was one of my bosses at Novell. Wonderful, wonderful woman who unfortunately died from ALS a few years ago. And she pushed me, and she she hired a coach for me because she saw potential in me that there were things that I was doing that helped me be successful, but at the next level were getting in my way and were stopping me from being successful. And she saw that there was more that I could do, so she pushed me, I was uncomfortable even, and she said, nope, you can do this. And when she passed away, it was, it was like a hole in the fabric of me because I called her all the time to just talk with her. Um, there were a number of other female executives that always were very supportive of me and that I learned from. So I'm, I'm a composite of all of those leaders. How do, your, how do you and your husband balance your um, time I mean, in the family? How do you make this work? I mean, as you tell the typical day, I can see that he must do a lot to help you and help things work at home. My husband, Brian, is awesome. We've been married 31 years, and he is, he's the most Christ-like person I've ever met. And I worried early in my career that as I was progressing, that that might be tough for him. And he says, sweetheart, I am warm in your shadow. So I'm always checking to make sure, and I'm always looking for ways to make his life better because he's not supposed to be the mom, and, but he does. I can't do it without him. It does take two of us. And I worry, since I travel so much, I, I worry that it's going to be a tough road for him. He's very close to my sons, and he makes it look really easy. But we, every time, any chance we can be together, we're together. So if we can ride bikes together, we do that. If we can go shopping together, he hates it, but he'll do it. If he just wants to be with me, I just want to be with him. So I think that, I think that it works. What else? Where have we not graphs that you'd like us to, um, I mean, feel like we're just getting We haven't talked about surface. science and technology, engineering Wait, and math, right, so right. that's an important thing for me. Talk about that. I'm a big supporter of the STEM initiative for young people, not just young women, so STEM, science, technology, engineering and math. I need more young people in high school to decide that they're good at it and that they can make, have great careers staying in those disciplines. Because you can make more money in those disciplines, but you can also have more options. So it doesn't mean that if you wanna be a hairdresser, that that's not a great career, but that's a hard career. And it's a lot of work. So if you're going to be, if you're gonna be away from your family, if you're gonna work, why not make as much money as possible? There are not enough young people who are looking at degrees in science and technology. They think it's too hard, they think they're not good at math. They're wrong. You don't have to be a coder to be in technology. There are many, many wonderful career opportunities with technology companies. And if you think about information, what you know right now, only 15% of it will be relevant in five years. It's terrifying for people that are not in technology. So we need more young people to be serious about it and to work hard and to hang in there because they will have many, many options as they grow up. And we need, as, as in America, we need, in America, we need more students who can stay competitive. What programs or volunteer work or uh, foundations are you involved with in a, 
in a contributing way, um, volunteer way. I know that you are with UVU. So I work with a lot of the local universities for their entrepreneurial programs, their masters of accounting programs, their MBA programs. I work with a lot of uh, young people in high school. I speak. Anytime I'm asked, I look for ways to say yes for young people, for um, women who are struggling, who just need to be inspired. Not that I'm super inspirational, but I have lots of good stories, and I try to make them laugh. Um, I work with um, the cancer organization, so the ovarian cancer organization, to my band plays for their annual gala event, but also working with women who have been diagnosed who just don't know what to do. I work with Huntsman Cancer. They're an amazing operation. They have a culture of care, and they're doing a really good job. I teach Sunday school, little 12-year-olds, that I'm trying to get those little dudes to be better and to be tougher and to not be afraid. And I really, really try to have about 20 young people that I mentor either through Facebook or texting or email or calling. A lot of them are single moms who made choices that kind of caused them difficulty now and trying to help them navigate those tough waters because they need people to help them. Amazing. You're doing a great job. You You're know, and it's still, it's good. not enough. I have, there's like so much that I want to do and it's, um, I just feel like if everyone did what they could, then it would be better. If everyone did what they could, stop watching TV, stop spending time. I call it building a bridge to nowhere. Stop building a bridge to nowhere. Start talking to young people and tell them about your struggles and tell them that you were shy. When my Facebook friends from high school see me, they're like, how did you become this person? You were so shy. I'm like, yeah, I was shy. I said, what do you remember about me? And they say, you were really shy. You were really smart. You were really funny and you were really tall. Are you still really tall? I'm like, yes, I'm still really tall. Was there a specific moment when you stopped being shy? Do you, do you remember an experience or anything that? I hated being shy. It's isolating to be shy. But I didn't want to talk to anyone, so it was kind of this problem. When I was 17, my father was stationed at the Pentagon, and he said, we're moving to Virginia. And I remember saying, I'm not going. And so my dad said, she's old enough. So I lived by myself in Germany. My parents moved to the States. And when you're shy living by yourself, you can't get a lot done. So I started to realize I'm going to have to talk to people. And then it wasn't so bad. And then I got better and better and better. And when I came to BYU, I took every speech class that I could take so that I would get over being afraid to speak in public. And the more that I did it, the more that I could do it, I still get really nervous. I'm still, I still rather sit and read a book, but I have to move toward anxiety and talk to people. And when I do, I'm always happy that I did. So let me get this right. Your parents left you in Germany. I know. 17. I had $550 in my checking account. Where, would, where did you live? I lived in a maid's quarters that had a bed and a sink and I took the bus. I didn't know how to drive and I would call on the little payphone every Saturday afternoon to check in and it was awful but I learned a lot about myself. I learned to be self-sufficient. I learned that you need people and that people want to help and people want to say yes and that I could do it. Did you visit your parents a couple of times? Never. How long did you live there alone? Oh, I lived there, I don't know, almost, I think almost a year I lived there. What part of Germany were you? I lived in Heidelberg. So you speak German, I assume? I speak German. I used to be a lot better at it, but it comes back when I go back over there. How many years total did you live in Germany? I lived there eight years. That's all I knew. I loved it. When I came to the States, I was super backward, though, because... <laughs> The music's different, the movies are different, the, there's no TV, really, Armed Forces Network. So when I came to BYU, it was, I was super backward. So Provo, Utah in 1981, I, I, I didn't match at all. But it was still a wonderful place to be. Wow, wow, interesting.
interesting. I would too. never leave a seventeen-year-old child overseas. Yeah, yeah, it's hard. I'm trying to wrap my head around that. That's that's. Big. My father, my father said she's old enough. She's old enough to decide. And that tells you they have a lot of confidence. Yeah, in they're great parents. They're great. They're humble, humble servants of the planet, and they, they, they did a good job with what they had. They did a good job. I worked and went to school. So I bought all my food every day on my way. I had yogurt and fruit and I just kind of bought, I just bought what I needed every day. It's very German to buy your food every day. I didn't know how to drive, so I took the streetcar. I didn't learn to drive until I was married. I kept to myself, I studied, I went to school, I worked at the exchange as a cashier and I went to church, took the bus and a streetcar to get to church and I did it. The lady you mentioned from your church group, I'm assuming it was a young woman. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you mind giving us her name? No, and was no. she in Germany? She was in Germany. So my young woman advisor's name was Gail Monroe. And I didn't know at the time, but she was going through a divorce. She had three children. And she would drive me to steak dances. She took me to meetings. I was on a youth committee to build... Uh, youth conference and a bunch of programs. So I, I learned um, about events as a young person, and she was she wasn't able to go to my graduation because she was leaving Germany, but she gave me a little necklace with the letter C with a diamond in it. It was my first diamond, and she said, I, "I will always believe in you." So I still have that necklace. I'm still really close to her, and she's part of who I became because she pushed me as a young person. She drove me to a dance, it was two hours away. I was 16 years old, it was my first dance. And no one asked me to dance at the dance. I didn't dance one time in this pink cotton candy dress. And the whole way back, she just chattered and just tried to lift me. And I felt like the biggest loser on the planet. But she was always there. And I never forgot that. Was she American or German? She was American. And did you attend American schools? Went to American high school, American middle school, because I wanted to play sports. And if you if you went to the, uh, they called it living on the economy. If you lived on the economy and went to the gymnasium, you could play sports, but it wasn't organized sports. So I got to play basketball and volleyball and soccer and field hockey, and I just loved it. Just loved it. You mentioned books, and I know you love to read. Is there a favorite book you have, or? You know, I re I'm a voracious reader, and I read everything. So I used to read mostly nonfiction. But then when I was sick, I realized I have a blind spot in my life because there's wonderful fiction out there. So I read a lot of biographies. I don't really have a favorite book. Um, and I really never have read a book twice because I just feel like there's so many books. But I read about Lincoln. I read about D-Day. Right now, I'm reading about Patton. I I, I read mysteries. I I'm usually reading six or seven books at a time. So what are you reading right now? Right now, I'm reading Killing Patton, and I'm reading um, the last James Rollins book. That have you met, have you read him? He's fabulous. I've read everything he's written. Um, uh, I read, I just, I finished uh, the summer while I was in Normandy, I read D-Day by Stephen Ambrose. And I've had it on my list forever, but since my grandfather was killed in that war, I just, I think I shied away from it. And to read that book while I was there, unbelievable what we were able to pull off on that day. Unbelievable. It's just, it's worth the read because Band of Brothers was written by Stephen Ambrose, I believe, and it's from the research that he's done for D-Day is just fantastic. Killing Patton. Patton was killed in Heidelberg, Germany, so there's a plaque in the hospital where he died, and it looks like it was an assassination. It doesn't look like it was an accident that he died. But he died on December 21st, 1945, and he said this is a terrible way for a soldier to die from a car accident. Can't wait to get through that one. We know you're busy and you need to go, but is there one, give, give us one idea of an award you received <coughs> in business that was meaningful? I work with the Women Tech Council to create a community of women who are in technology who just want to be part of something really cool. 
And I've worked with Sid Tetro and that group from the beginning. So I was delighted to have been nominated for a leadership award. And I was up against some pretty amazing women. So I didn't invite anyone to come because I didn't think I would win. And when I won, I don't think I could barely walk on the stage. I was shaking because um, it was just to be nominated by my peers and people that I care about. I thought that was pretty cool. What's the name of the award? I think it was the leadership. I think it was leadership. I'll have to check, but it's not in here. It's in my son's room. All my awards go into my son's room That's because good. he's like, well, and it's a very cool award with these gears and in the shape of a woman with a compass. And I think it's leadership excellence, but He's like, Mom, I totally need that in my room. And I'm like, you totally need it in there. So it's in there with um, all, all my other, anything else I get, he, if I get a medallion from something, he wears it, and, and I love that. Otherwise, it just collects dust on somebody's desk. Is this your youngest son? My youngest son is 12, Davis, and he's the survivor of a set of triplets. And he is this magical child who is the sparkle in my life and he's like an old man jammed into a little boy's body not so little he's 200 pounds but he is just a lovely lovely human good manners unfiltered very respectful loves this planet and uh, I love that kid I just I just love that kid Tell us about your other son a little more about him, too. What's his name? My older son, Strom, is 20. He's serving an LDS mission in Taiwan. He speaks Chinese. He's this brilliant, brilliant child that uh, came to me after, after 11 years of trying to have kids. Uh, he won first place chemistry and biochemistry at the State Science Fair at 15. Has done a TED talk, TEDx talk. He plays all the music he's learned. He knows he has it in his head. He's a third degree black belt in Taekwondo. He's a champion debater. He's a scientist. He's just a brilliant, brilliant human. And I love to talk to him because that's why I have to read everything because he is so knowledgeable and he wants to understand everything. Mom, I don't understand why they don't have a monument to James Madison. He's the father of the Constitution. Mom, have you read all the documents that our founding fathers have read? List them in order. Go. Mom, explain Nietzsche to me. I, it's like that all the time. All the time. So I'm a better, I'm a better student because of this, this kid. And he'll, go, he'll come back and he'll do great things. But he's, he's dominating it in Taiwan. And he speaks Chinese. He had four years of Chinese before he left. So he wanted to be super prepared. So I just need to make sure he's super prepared for life. Awesome. In closing, give us, give us advice for Utah women in general. Um, you've lived here since when? 1981. So you, you know the culture. You know the challenges, I'm sure. Um, <coughs> Give, give some advice in general to Utah women, if you don't mind. I was speaking at a function recently, and they introduced me as one of the female CEOs from Utah, the worst state for women. So that's terrible, and we've got to change that. Utah's a great state for women, but it's going to take all of us to make sure that everybody knows that. We need to not be afraid. We need to push the boundaries that we create for ourselves and we need to push the boundaries that others put around us because it's really ours to fix and there's really nowhere to go but up right now so we need to change this and we need to make sure that the women of Utah understand that they can do anything that they want to do that they should never let fear determine their fate and we really do need each other to be able to do it. Wonderful, Corinne. Thank you. Is there anything else you'd like to? Are you okay? Yeah, you did fabulous. Did. Anything <laughs> you else you'd great. like to? In fact, can I use that quote with Susan Madsen's talk board on that? You're okay if I pull that yeah, up yeah. this very day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was great. That was great. Um, anything else you want to add? Did, did no. Else? No. How about Danny? She's, She's awesome. fabulous. Yeah, that was good. You got to get that degree done so I you can, so I can go, go and the whole thing. Exactly. yeah. Reconnected recently, you um, invited me to see you give a, a presentation, and the topic it was one word, and I remember it was so powerful, and I'm blanking on the word. It was like was it disruption? It was disruption. 
So I gave, there's a TED, there's a TED type talk that I did for Women Tech Council. It's only eight minutes long on disruption. Have you read, have you? It's online, it's on, it's on video. If, okay, so you look that up. I will. And Just then look up anything disruption. you have, talk to, given anything that's an easy word doc you can send to her, she's a good writer. Okay. She will write a good short biography of you. And if you, um, um, if you just Google my name in quote, in, um, yeah, quotes, then a lot of that stuff will come up. There's some UVU stuff out there. Okay. The, if you Google my name in quotes and then put um, women's tech, then you'll get that. That presentation, they asked me to talk about disruption. They want me to talk about the cancer. And I was like, I don't think I can do it. I think I've seen those. Yeah, I don't think I can yeah. do it. And Catherine Shumway said, you have to give this talk. You have to do it. So we're going to rehearse you. You're going to have to do it. So I over, I over rehearsed. I mean, I over, I was super nervous. And because I had to do it in eight minutes. And um, this, it, when I talk about the cancer, sometimes I get a little frayed around the edges. Um, and when I talk about my son uh, being the only survivor of triplets, those are two, two tough ones. But uh, I did it. And there were people that came up to me afterwards that said, I needed to hear that or everyone knows someone with cancer. Everyone has touched their lives. And I had no cancer in my family, no cancer in my history. I've never had a drink in my life. I've never had a drug in my life. I gave birth to two children with no medicine. I don't, I don't fit. So when they said you have cancer, I'm like, I have cancer? How is that possible? Mm -hmm. And um, it affects everybody. So I didn't really want to, someone said to me, do you want to be defined by your cancer? And I'm like, no, I don't want to be defined by my cancer. But I'm not going to be afraid to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And I am actually refined by my cancer. And just like, OK. Good for you. Well, that disruption yeah. theme was really powerful for a lot of people in the audience, yeah. just because it's, it is simple to form. It's, things happen in life that are not for plan. And it can be a wonderful opportunity. Just yeah, yeah. and embrace, if you can embrace, everyone has it. Everyone has disruption, everyone. Mm -hmm. And my son, my little son doesn't like, does not like change at all. So I'm working with him, I call it SEAL Team Clark. Adapt, improvise, overcome. I need him to be resilient because we all have change. The only thing that is never gonna change that. is that there's always gonna be change. So if you can become resilient, there are a lot of things we can do, right? When I thought I was gonna die, I was like, I'm gonna be that person that dies at 48? Oh, and there's gonna be a second wife who's gonna spend my money and be mean to my kids? <laughs> well, that's the route I went down. And I was like, look, you can't control this. So I embraced it and I went to the care center every week because I did chemotherapy every week. I brought treats for everyone. Mrs. Clark, how are you feeling today? Fantastic. Even when I felt terrible. Because everybody in the cancer center has cancer. Mm -hmm. And they have it worse than I do. There's some that are not going to get out of there. So every day that I was here, I decided when I finished my treatment, I did six months of weekly chemo, and then I did one year of chemotherapy every 21 days. And I decided that every day that I wake up, it's binary. If I'm here, it's a one. It's all good. If I'm not here, it's a zero, and I'm a little bugged. But every day, I'm here, it's all good. It's all good. Still feel that way. <laughs> Truly. Did you go to Huntsman? I went to Huntsman. And they, Huntsman is like hallowed ground for me. The doctors and the nurses. So I had the chemotherapy for 18 months. I had perfect care. I never had anyone say an unkind word to me. I never had anyone give me any trouble. I had, it was like I was at a spa. That's fantastic. And so I, w the commute didn't bother me, the drive up there didn't bother me, the expense didn't bother me, and the doctors and the nurses were just spectacular. And when I saw John Huntsman, I shook his hand and I was like, God bless you for creating a place like this. Because it's unlike any I'd ever seen my whole life. Yeah, it's pretty cool up there. That's part of why I think I survived too, is because they really lift you to be positive and they don't give you false hope. I mean, that's not what they're about. 
but they one time I, my veins I couldn't get the medicine in my veins before I got my port and they're like we know who to they called like the vein whisperer and she came and hot towels and sweetheart and just you know and then she found a vein and I'm like you're magical and she's like I find veins in infants that's her job to find veins in infants because they don't you know they're not obvious but they just and the people love being there so even when you're sick I just was so happy to be it was a blessing to be there and so whenever they ask me to help I'm happy to help what do you do for them just speak I speak I go to a lot of races I um, if I get a call from someone who is nervous about their care I talk to them I'm really close to my oncologist and to my doctors and my nurses I had the same ones for 18 months and I every chance I can go and visit with them and help I'll do it yeah, I'm hopelessly devoted to them. I write checks, uh, my band plays, whatever they need. Um, I'm happy to do it because there's just not enough, there's not enough people that are helping and there's more that we can all do. Indeed. Yeah. But you're amazing, thank you. Oh, no, guys, I'm just a girl. Just a girl just with a big hair.